okay, when I walked in here, um, no fans, no anything was running, and I could hear a leak coming from here. This guy right here. So I played with it, and I went ahead and let management know. I shut it off right there. Now the leak has stopped. But the scary thing is they don't have a CO2 alarm in here, right? They got all this CO2, and you could be standing in here, and you don't even know, and you're just going to pass out because that displaces the oxygen. So you always got to protect yourself and watch out. But I'm very surprised they don't. I, I thought OSHA required them to have a CO2 alarm in here, um, but they don't for whatever reason. So, but you always want to watch out for yourself. Safety first. This video is brought to you by Sportland. Quality, integrity, and tradition. All right, today we've got a beer walk-in and they said that the fan stopped working yesterday. They do have a power switch right here. They said they flipped the power switch a bunch of times. Nothing's happening. Um, there's no ice. This coil does have defrost heaters because it isn't a beer walk and they run like 34 degree box temp or something like that. So um, we need to go ahead and start up at the condensing unit because that's where the power should be coming from on this guy. So my equipment is up on this mezzanine up here, but their elevator is broken. So I gotta go find the stairs to get up there, but to be continued. All right, so my condensing unit is right here. Um, we've got a disconnect switch on there. That's where we're gonna have to start is by checking power. Just doing a walk around. There's no condensation. This thing hasn't been running for a while. This call actually came in yesterday, and I'm surprised they didn't have me do it as an emergency call. Condenser's a little dirty, so uh, we need to open this guy up. All right, uh, it's a little tight over here, but you know, definitely doable. So let's go ahead and check three phase power coming in, okay? Let me move my meter over here. There's the backlight on it, and uh, here we go. One to two, nothing. Two to three, 215. One to three, 215. And then one to two, nothing. So it looks like we have a blown fuse, which would be in there. Why do we have a blown fuse is the question. Um, before we proceed any further, what we're gonna go ahead and do is turn off the disconnect switch and we're gonna start ohming everything out or toning everything out to check for any direct shorts to ground that are obvious. Um, spin all the fan motors, power's off. Fan motors are not locked up. Um, we'll check the compressor. We're gonna check everything and then we'll look into changing the fuse and trying to figure out why this fuse might have blown. I made sure that I had a good path to ground, okay? Basically, find a ground screw and then find another good source, like that, okay? Make sure you have a good path. And then I checked every connection to ground and I'm getting no direct shorts on the line or load side of the contactor. Um, fan motors all spin. So at this point, it always helps to look at where it was at when it shut off. Notice that it was in defrost. So what we need to do is go downstairs and have a look at the evaporators because this thing potentially shorted when it was in defrost or had an overcurrent situation in defrost that potentially blew the fuses. So power's off, we'll make sure we lock it out safely and then we'll go downstairs to the evaporator and then start inspecting the evaporator to see if we can find an electrical short down there. Okay, when I walked in here, um, no fans, no anything was running and I could hear a leak coming from here. This guy right here. So I played with it and I went ahead and let management know. I shut it off right there. Now the leak has stopped, but the scary thing is they don't have a CO2 alarm in here, right? They got all this CO2 and you could be standing in here and you don't even know and you're just gonna pass out because that displaces the oxygen. So you always gotta protect yourself and watch out. But I'm very surprised they don't. I, I thought OSHA required them to have a CO2 alarm in here, um, but they don't for whatever reason. So, but you always wanna watch out for yourself, safety first. All right, so. Got the coil opened up. I checked all the terminals to ground. I didn't get any direct shorts, okay? So then we just gotta start investigating and looking. Um, very, very common electrical short issue is where these rub out. That is exposed wire, but you don't just stop at the first thing you see because sometimes they can be intermittent, right? 
So you come over here and you look at this one. Exposed wire too. So we gotta tear this thing apart. We're gonna have to fix all of these, reroute them, and then uh, continue on. Look at the bottom. There's wires just sitting on the bottom. That could be rubbed out too. So big picture stuff here. Um, your electrical section, for those that don't know, when you have power turned off, there's literally two screws that hold that on. You can pull it out of the way so you can get in here and inspect to see if there's anything funky. You always want to look at your limit switches to see if they're swollen. I'm not seeing anything else obvious. We're still going to have to fire this guy into heat later, make sure the defrost heaters all work, but for the time being, it actually looks like this is the only one that shorted. Um, this one doesn't really look like it's got exposed wire, but we're still going to repair it. Um, and then what happens is, is they have an aftermarket energy audit company come in and put all these BS motors and plastic blades in. And we've had a lot of issues where the blades fell off, they weren't tightened, wires are not installed right, that kind of stuff. So see what we can do to correct it. All right, now I like to orient these guys so that way they can only be plugged in from one direction. That way you can control where the wires are gonna go. So I'm actually cutting these wires short and uh, that way nobody can make this mistake again is the hope. I know it'll irritate people when they accidentally put the motor in backwards and they gotta rotate it, but it saves careless technicians from causing me grief, you know, at nighttime when I'm ready to stay home and that kind of stuff. I'm actually surprised because uh, this came in last night and this is their main beer walk and it's been down since yesterday. They didn't want it as an emergency. They just did it as a uh, 24 hour response time. So I figured I'd come in and it'd be something silly. Like they just put in a call and they weren't too worried about it. But now this whole thing's down. Oh, whatever. I didn't want to come out last night anyways. Oh, yep. Always double check your butt splices. That one didn't take. I know they have heat shrink butt splices and stuff. I don't have them this time. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. My normal supply house doesn't carry them, so I have to order them. Oh, that is the second time I've done that. Good gosh, you think I'd have learned the first time. Always give them a tug to make sure they're tight and my light just turned off. You know, there's actually an art to using wire strippers, especially this style. You have to know which notches to use. I see a lot of people that struggle and they're trying. If you're trying and you're struggling, you're doing something wrong. If you cut it at the right spot, it should come off pretty effortlessly. Uh, and also when you're doing butt splices, you want them to match up. This one's not matching up, so. Gonna cut that one down, strip it back just a little bit further. And when you're pulling to pull the jacket off, I loosen it. I'm not holding it tight anymore to pull it. I, I It's just like, it takes time to figure out how to use wire strippers, but I see a lot, especially newer techs that really struggle with them. But some older techs too I see struggling. It's like, man, I like my job to be easy, not hard. All right, so these dodo heads that came in with these motors, they don't fit in the old little saddle. See the saddle right here, it clips and holds that plug in. It doesn't work anymore. So unfortunately, I'm having to zip tie to the motor brackets. Now I'm doing a double zip tie to where the wire is not touching the metal bracket. The wire is actually rubbing up against the first zip tie. And then there's another zip tie ran through it. It's kind of hard to see. That's holding the wire from touching the metal bracket. And then we have to run a zip tie here too. I hate doing that because, and I, I curse at people when they do that, because when you go to defrost these coils, which happens, you gotta undo zip ties. But sometimes you gotta do it, especially when they use these stupid motors that don't get clamped. This is what I'm talking about, that, that little clamp, they broke them and pulled them back. So we gotta do that or they'll vibrate out. 
Um, we'll have to do that for everyone. And then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, repair this one too. So I got that fixed, all those. I'm inspecting all the other wires. We're not seeing any problems. So I'm gonna assemble it and we'll get up onto the roof and turn this guy back on and see what happens. All right, we're back up on the roof. I put three new fuses because I changed all three, even if one blows. And I put three spares for the next guy. I'm gonna go ahead and close this up and uh, get ready to fire this guy up and see what happens. All right, I took it out of defrost. And we're just gonna do a one, two, three, please don't blow up. I can hear a solenoid valve opened. Condensing unit's on, it's a good sign. We're gonna test all unit operations, let it run for a bit, and then eventually we'll throw it into a defrost. One of these motors doesn't sound too good either. So one of these guys is making a funny like vibrating noise that kind of sounds like a bearing issue, but I don't wanna shut the unit down. I wanna let the unit run for a bit and bring it down to temp. I will look into that in a minute, but we're just gonna let it, that way we're not short cycling it or anything. We'll let it drop the box down in temp a bit. One thing that really sucks is because this is electric defrost and it runs higher temps, it takes forever to turn on because of the limit switches. So you've got your fan delay and the crappy thing is, is they flood the compressor on startup, especially in a, a hot pull down like this because it's like 70 degrees in here. So it's going to take a little bit longer for that coil to get cold enough for the over or the uh, clicks on relay to shut for the fans to turn on, but we're just letting it run. Um, this was frosted up really bad, but the frost went away, so I have a feeling the fans turned on. So we're going to give it time to come down to temperature and then we're going to test the defrost. So it is under a heavy load. Um, I don't know, maybe the evaporator fan motor cycled off go down there but it was a clear sight glass you, you can't check the sight glass if the fans aren't running unfortunately it's like a 10 minute walk down to where the evaporators are because of this structure that I'm in um, so we're gonna go down there and make sure that the evaporators are running I'm also gonna get my blower turn it on blow these condensers out too um, it's kind of funny because uh, there's a car behind me that was up here like doing Instagram videos you know like cold revs and stuff in the morning getting ready to do burnouts and it was annoying me, so I have these uh, giant cooling fans right here, these big things. I have them shut off because they're noisy as heck when I'm up here. They're irritating me, so I just went and turned them all on, and they quickly stopped filming because <laughs> they're so loud. It's kind of funny. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that those fans turned on because there was much more frost on this coil the last time I came up here, or came down here when they weren't running yet. And so because of the high ambient in here, when the fan motors turn on, they start grabbing the heat and it heats up the coil to where the limit switches shut it off again. It's kind of a pain. You could bypass the limit switches if you want to temporarily to get it running, but uh, we'll let it run a minute longer and see. So these uh, cooling fans right here, pretty dusty. Let's give them a blast and then we're going to uh, do that for all of them. And then this guy right here, Give it a blast. Get all the stuff coming out. These guys don't do regular maintenance, so. Those cars moved because I they were still in their cars and I just told them I'm about to make it dusty. <laughs> they, they moved. <laughs> Alright, it was taking too long, so I just quickly made a jumper out of that green wire temporarily. Jumped out the fan motors, so that way it's running. We're gonna let it run, bring the box down to temp, then I'll pull the jumper out. But it was just taking too long to come on. Alright, now we're really looking good. We're running. Obviously, we've just got a cold suction line back now because we're not flooding the evaporator and flooding back to the compressor anymore. Um, sight glass is clear. Good, good image there. I don't at this time see a need to put service gauges on the system. We're just gonna watch it for a bit. I gotta see that box. This, this is gonna be a hurry up and wait thing because I gotta see the box come down to temperature to the point that I can test the defrost circuit. So we're just gonna let it run. It's uh, I'd say probably about 48 degrees in there right now. So it's gonna take some time. All right, I just clicked the guy into defrost. It just pumped down. Uh, jump on this white wire right here. We have 10 amps of current. So there is heaters running, whether or not that's all the heaters, I don't know. So we're gonna go down there and test that. All right, I just took my amp clamp, 
clamped it on every one of these bottom wires on the H1 terminal. They all have current, so all the heaters are working. I'm not seeing any issues, so we're gonna tell the customer to keep an eye on it, and we're gonna chalk it up as an electrical short because of that wire that rubbed on the bracket. Um, but, you know, it didn't do it in front of my face. I only found the issue, so there could always be something else going on, so we're always gonna have a disclaimer in the invoice. All right, and this is a good sign because I came back up, and it's only been two, three minutes, and uh, it's running, so that means that the defrost termination switch is also working. So I'm gonna do a current test on both those condenser fan motors. Just do a quick check on these wiring right here. And then I'll make recommendations to the customer. Um, one, that motor right there is making a funny noise, but uh, I can already tell you they're not gonna approve it today. So um, I'm gonna wrap this one up. It was almost the same situation on the very first video of my YouTube channel. Um, still the first video. And it's how I go through the process of you know, replacing fuses that are bad. I don't just replace fuses, and that's the most important thing. Fuses don't usually go bad for any for no reason. I mean, something caused it. A high current situation, um, obviously, it's a type of a high current situation and or a direct short, you know. Um, but, you know, they, they don't just go bad, right? It's very rare, okay? So always dig into it and don't just stop at the first problem like i said the wire that shorted against the metal bracket okay that's great i found one but i'm going to keep looking we're going to keep going through everything we're going to keep testing doing the best to our ability to try to find the problem now in this situation it never happened in front of me i walked up to a blown fuse so you know and i didn't just put the fuse in and then see if it happened again you know we go through and we try to find the problem okay so we found a shorted wire, we found another potential shorted wire, then I went ahead and corrected the third motor wire, and then just investigated everything else, all right? So it's so important to make sure that we're being thorough like that, and doing the best, right? Doing our best job, basically. And trying to, you know, take care of the customer. Because taking care of the customer, building that relationship and earning their trust is gonna go uh, miles with them, right? What happens if that particular restaurant manager leaves that restaurant chain and goes to work for someone else? There's always a possibility that he's going to remember your name and he's going to want you to go out there and do it. That has happened to me. That is how my business has grown is by restaurant managers moving on to new concepts and then taking me with to the, to the new concept with them. And I, I start working for a new restaurant chain and start working for a new restaurant chain. Okay. That's like kind of, in my opinion, the best way to get customers is by your reputation. Your reputation is drawing them to you, you know, or their friends say, man, I'm really looking for a contractor. I'm having a hard time with mine. Hey, I got this guy. You should check him out. He helps me out. He's not the cheapest, but he gets it done and he gets it done right. Okay. That's what I hope is said about me. I hope that people realize I'm not the cheapest. I'm also not the most expensive, but when I do a job, I do my best, okay? And and I do have problems and I do make mistakes, but I own up to them and I make sure the customer is aware. I'll tell the customer about mistakes that I made. They would have never known otherwise, but I bring it up to them. Make sure that they know, hey, just so you know, I actually ruined this motor. It's my bad. I'm going to go ahead and replace it. No charge to you. You're not even going to notice the difference. We're going to get it going, you know? Always take care of the customer, all right? Um, I really appreciate you guys making it to the end. This will be my last video before uh, the Christmas holiday. So for those of you that celebrate it, Merry Christmas to all of you guys. For those that don't, Happy Holidays. Whatever holiday you celebrate, I hope you get to spend time with your family. Um, I, you know, that's that's it's so important these days to remember that. And this is the way that I reflect on things. My problems are so petty. They really are, okay? Here I am worried about how I'm going to continue to make <clears throat> as many videos as I need to make, how I'm going to meet these obligations of videos that people want me to make for them, you know? And, and, and I get frustrated, and I have to, like, laugh at myself and think, like, wow, I'm frustrated because I don't know where I'm going to find the time to make more videos, you know? And it's like I have the ability to do something like that. I mean, you know, there, there's the, the, this is my logic. There's people out there that don't know if they're going to get to eat dinner on Christmas, that don't know if they have money to buy food. That really makes me think twice, you know, and really makes me reflect on what I call my petty problems because my problems in comparison to majority of other people are very, very petty. So I'm very thankful for those things. I'm thankful for my petty problems. Um, I hope 
that you and your family have an amazing holiday. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. And uh, I will catch you on the next one, okay?